Have you ever looked at a drawing and wondered who in their right mind designed this thing? From tricky to utterly impossible to manufacture, we've all seen these kind of drawings come across our desk before, whether you've been in this trade for a day or whether you've been in this trade for 20 years. Today, we're gonna to be talking about designing a part from the ground up to hopefully make you not part of the problem. What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinist. Like I said, today we're gonna to be talking about designing a part from the ground up. But before we do, make sure you like and subscribe below if you wanna see more videos. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so today on Shop Talk, as promised, we're gonna be talking about designing a part from the ground up. Um, basically, there are gonna be a lot of opportunities in your career as a machinist to design parts whether you're designing fixturing for yourself, whether you're designing work holding, whether a customer is coming to you and saying, you know what, I need a part for this function, or you know, you are someone who needs to de develop a product that you're wanting to sell. There are gonna be a lot of opportunities for you to do design. And there are a lot of considerations that can save you a lot of pain and headache when it comes to doing this. Uh, for some background guys, I have developed and designed parts you know, that are as big as entire machines that have to be functional. I developed parts that are, and designed parts that are as big as the head of a pencil and everywhere in between. And most importantly, I've made a lot of mistakes doing it, as I'm sure some of you guys have too. So hopefully I can share some of those with you and give you some steps that will hopefully save you a bit of time and effort and you can, you know, take my mistakes and learn from them because, you know, there are a lot of places you can go wrong when designing a part and some things that if you think about before you start can make life really easy for you. So the first thing you want to consider when you're designing a part is material. This is what my steps guys, by the way, too, you know, everybody has their own way. This is what I consider. If you guys have different ways that you like to do this, please share them below in the comments because it is handy. But to go back to it, the first thing that I consider is material. Over engineering when it comes to designing a part can start right from material selection. Um, and for those of you guys who don't know, over engineering when it comes to machining can be just as detrimental as under engineering. And when I say over engineering, I mean a lot of times if a, part, a person comes in and they need a part done, if you're jumping right to 304 stainless steel or ink canal or you know some kind of crazy material just because you can, that's over engineering. If they only really need a part made of aluminum, you're trying to sell them on something they don't need, it's over engineering. It's gonna be detrimental because not only does working with a more difficult or more exotic material take more time, beat up more cutters, uh, you know, different grades of stainless are harder to tap, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, guys, unless you're just building it for yourself, this is something that somebody is going to have to pay for, and you are gonna have to convince them to pay for it. If right off the bat, you're selecting something that's gonna make that job 10 times more expensive than if you had done it in a cheaper, more available material, that job's gonna be a non-starter. You know, if somebody comes to me and they want a bracket for their cell phone to hold a camera, and I'm trying to sell them on, you know, a big brass fixture for it for some reason, that job's never gonna happen. And you know, it can look as cool as it, as it can, and I can think it's gonna be as neat as I want. But if it's not practical for the application, and it's gonna be way more expensive than it needs to be, you're not gonna get that job. So to start off, guys, I always like to think simple and then build up. Does this job need to have, or sorry, does this part need to be strong? Does this part need to have corrosion resistance? Does this part need to have wear resistance? Basically, I'll start from somewhere like aluminum and just say, you know what, is aluminum gonna do the job? No. Okay, what about mild steel? No. What about stainless steel? And build up from there. Basically, I start with the most readily available and easy to machine things that I can and work up from there. I end up using a lot of aluminum for a lot of stuff, guys, because it machines super easily. I can get it easily. Uh, it's not gonna beat up my cutters. You know, if you have a really good high helix three fluid end mill, that thing will stay sharp at aluminum for a very long time. Um, it's about not only tool life and longevity, but my cycle times are gonna be half of that than they are gonna be in steel, you know, without having to invest in expensive tooling, but we'll get to that. So to start off, guys, you want to select a material that is going to work for your job. Obviously, one consideration, never substitute a cheaper or worse material because you are cheap or lazy. This is about finding the intersection between, you know, expense and machining time and what your customer actually needs. Um, if you know 
that this chub should be in steel and you're substituting aluminum because you know you don't want to set up for steel or whatever that's going to backfire you on you as well so trying to find where those two concerns meet is going to help once you've done that the second thing you want to consider is stock size and material availability so those of you guys who maybe don't order material maybe you're a machinist who you know your your main functions are on the floor maybe you're an operator you may not know availability of certain materials. I have made this mistake before many, many times where I'm designing a part and I get too far into it before I go and look at material availability. I get approval. Oh yeah, you know, this uh, this customer wants to make this. Yeah, no problem. I'll start with 78303 uh, stainless. Only to find out that 78303 stainless is an oddball size, maybe. Or that 78 stainless and 303 does not exist from my suppliers. So now I need to buy one inch, I need to turn it down. All of a sudden I've already cornered out that job that I designed and I'm already starting to lose money. Maybe not lose money, but there's now the considerations in there that I hadn't even thought of. The other thing to think about guys is most materials are available in certain nominal sizes. So you know, a half inch by one in aluminum, you're gonna find tons of it. Half inch by five eighths, maybe not. Half inch by seven eighths, probably not. And the thing is that certain nominal sizes, you gotta remember this isn't proportionate where one by two is necessarily going to be half as expensive by half, as half by one. Mills who develop this material, you know, who push out thousands of tons of these uh, bars every year, don't necessarily push out the same equal amounts of everything. They're gonna push out more material for sizes that people use, meaning that material is going to be cheaper. I know when it comes to, for example, I did a job kind of recently that was 304 steel and I didn't even think to check for some reason. It just slipped my mind and I quoted it out in a size that wasn't nominal and it was halfway between two nominal sizes, but I quoted it out thinking that I'm going to use that size. That size, because it wasn't a common nominal size, cost me almost as much as if I had bought double as much material and a larger size which I ended up doing and milling it down because that was cheaper, but it could have been a really bad situation if for whatever reason I had to use that sock size. So going ahead and making sure before you even get into the actual design phase that whatever you know your kind of thoughts on the size of this part, whatever close material size is available and you know at a good price exists and that you can get it. Um, another thing is guys, you know, there's huge supply chain issues all the time. You know, if you're watching this video in a year, I don't know if that's been resolved, let's hope. But certain kinds of material right now, you just cannot get. I know in my area, for some reason, trying to get metric sizes of aluminum sheet, extremely difficult. I have no idea why. Inch, no problem. But if I was gonna go quote something out and design a part that was using metric nominal aluminum sheet right now, I might not even be able to get it. So keeping that in mind and doing that research before you get too far into the process is really gonna help. The last consideration when it comes to sock size and material availability is you want to pick something that is as close to the size as your part as possible. So for instance, let's say we did this part. If I'm picking something that is way too big in one direction because it's off the shelf, that's more material I have to remove. The entire thing when it comes to selling your machine time is that you're selling machine time. That's what it is, guys. That's really what kind of machining is at the end of the day. It's selling your spindle time. The more spindle time I have to put into a part to get that stock size down to my final part, the more expensive it has to be and the less competitive I can be on that part. So you wanna to try to select something that's a nominal size that's also as close to your part size finished as possible. The last, or I guess the next thing we wanna talk about and the third consideration is work holding and tooling availability. Notice guys, we haven't even designed the part yet. So now that you've got your stock size kind of dialed in, you know, you, you kind of think you know what you want to start with, you want to start looking at how do I hold that part? So, you know, basically what this comes down to guys is simple is always better. If I can get away with using parallels and a vise in one op to do that part, I want to do that. I don't want to make fixturing for a part that I can do in a vise. It doesn't make sense. That said, maybe by using a fixture and putting that money into it up front, I can actually make that part better, make it easier. So you want to start considering, you know, am I going to do a hundred of these? Am I going to do a thousand of these? Is it worth developing a fixture for this? Is it worth developing some kind of, you know, fourth axis fixture for this to be able to do it in one or two shots? 
And here's the thing, guys, you wanna consider this very, very strongly, I should say, because we all, as machinists, guys who have been in this tree for any length of time, we all have that job where we should have just built the fixture, or we should have just put the fourth axis in, but we didn't. And we said, no, we're gonna use five vices, we're gonna do it this way, this is the way to do it. And then you get halfway through the job of a thousand parts, you have a guy reloading five vices for two weeks, and you're just like, man, I should have just built the fixture. So now that you're thinking about work holding, the other part of this is tooling. If you have not designed a lot of parts before or you haven't you know, maybe done the programming end of things a lot, a big consideration when it comes to designing these parts, if you can do it, is the tooling. For instance, this part right here, it has a very large face here that needs to be done you know, fairly accurately. I think we have about a two to three thou step that we're allowable in there because this goes on top of something. And the problem with that is, that is a very, very long range of tooling to use. We didn't design this part. If I designed it, I probably would have tried to do some different things with it. But that is a big consideration when you're designing your part. Um, it's all fine if you have your sock size saying that you're gonna hold on to this much, you're gonna hold an extra quarter inch at the bottom of that part, and you're gonna machine the whole thing in one shot. Nice to think about on paper, you could go program it up on your computer and be like, this looks great. How is your tooling rigidity when it's out that long? Is tooling available in that length? You know, Can you get an off the shelf four inch cutter at half inch because you made the rads too small in there? Is the deflection gonna be crazy if you use anything under a three quarter? Like these are the considerations that go into it and it's all fine if you go program it on your computer and you say, yeah, I'm gonna use a two inch cutter that's four inches, that cutter doesn't exist. Or if it does, that cutter is going to be worth as much as the job to get done custom. Before you even actually draw that part, in my opinion, I always go through and try to make sure that I can do it or I wanna think about doing that part with conventional off the shelf tooling. Optimally, stuff I already have in my toolbox. Um, you know, it's, it's a matter of going back and forth between the work holding and the tooling. Again, it's about finding an intersection between those two points that makes sense. You know, maybe I wanna use work holding so I can have clearance, so I can use undercutting end mills everywhere, so I can chamfer it all in one shot and it's good to go. Um, maybe I wanna do it in a vise, leave a little bit more stock, but then I need to use longer end mills, but that's okay, because the part's only two inches long, I have two inch length to cut end mills. So it's about going back and forth, much like your material selection, about those two considerations, until you find that joining part where it kind of makes sense. After all that, guys, the fourth step, in my opinion, is actually designing the part. If you design your part to your work holding and to your tooling, you're going to have a way easier time when you machine it. Um, for instance, this is a big one. Let's say I have a big pocket in a part. So let's pretend that that's a square pocket in this part. That's two inches long. If I put 60 thou rods in that corner, that means I need to use something that is one eighth in diameter in order to get that right radius in the corner. That's over two inches. That's gonna be awful. You know, yeah, I could drill the corners. There's a lot of different considerations, but all I'm doing, if I do that without thinking about it, is add work and add time and add headache. You wanna use as rigid of tooling as you can. You want the fastest material removal that you can. So if you know that customer really does not care about the size of the rod in that corner, they just want a rod, well, how about a quarter inch? Then I can use a half inch cutter. It's all about developing that part to be machined as opposed to developing a part and then trying to figure out how to machine it. That's kind of what I go through, guys. I hope this has been helpful. Some of you guys who have done this for years and years and years, some of you guys are part designers and that's all you do is a job. I would love to hear what you guys think about when you're designing a part. I would love to hear your steps that you go through when you're designing a part because it's something that some guys really never think about and they're always trying to figure out how to machine things as opposed to designing them to be machined. Uh, so I'd love to hear that below in the comments if you guys have a chance. Thank you very much for watching, guys. As always, make sure you like and subscribe if you wanna see more videos. You take care.